Thank you so much, Allison, for that warm introduction. It's great to be here for this ninth annual Autism Science Foundation Day of Learning event. And so I'm going to be sharing with you today about shaping new federal priorities for autism research, services, and policy. So what is the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee? As Allison mentioned, it's a federal advisory committee created by Congress, established under the Combating Autism Act of 2006, and currently authorized under the Autism Cares Act of 2019. It includes 23 different federal agencies and departments and 20 public, 21 public members. The public members include autistic adults, parents and family members, and leaders of national advocacy, service, and research organizations. The membership of the IACC is diverse across the geography of the United States, gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, abilities, age, expertise, life experience, and organizations that serve people on the autism spectrum. This slide shows you the current makeup of the IACC, which is our largest and most diverse to date. It includes autistic adults, family members, researchers, advocates, clinicians, service providers, and many different agency officials from across the federal government. The IACC has a broad scope of activities, including autism research and services, and topics such as employment, justice, housing, and transition. So how do we cover such a broad scope of activities? The IACC serves as a forum, as a neutral territory, what I like to think of as the Switzerland of federal autism policy, <laughs> where federal agencies and community stakeholders can come together, people with diverse lived experience, diverse professional expertise, to address challenging issues across the whole lifespan and a wide range of needs across the autism spectrum. The charge of the IACC is manifold under the Autism Cares Act of 2019. It includes convening twice annually, coordinating federal agency activities related to autism, gathering public input on issues related to autism, developing and annually updating a strategic plan, developing an annual summary of advances in autism research, monitoring federal activities related to autism, and lastly, providing advice and making recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. The IACC is a federal advisory body. This means it makes recommendations about autism research, services, and policy to the HHS Secretary. It also provides guidance to federal agencies about priorities identified through the collective effort of community stakeholders and federal officials. What the IACC does not do is allocate funding or control implementation of autism research and service programs in the federal government. Federal agencies themselves decide how to allocate their appropriated budgets from Congress and plan their programs, taking into account the recommendations of the IACC. The IACC in its work issues a number of reports including the IACC strategic plan, the IACC summary of advances in ASD research, and the IACC portfolio analysis report, which is a report that analyzes research funding across US federal and private funders. And this report assists the IACC in their responsibility to monitor federal autism activities. So the first IACC strategic plan was focused exclusively on research in accordance with the Combating Autism Act of 2006. This plan is framed around seven consumer-based questions and topics that were decided by the IACC, including screening and diagnosis, the biology of autism, risk factors, treatments and interventions, lifespan issues, which was added in 2010, and infrastructure and surveillance. Currently, the IACC strategic plan is in its sixth edition that was issued in 2017. 
And it's organized around the same seven community-based questions and topics. In 2014, the Autism Cares Act required that the plan expand to cover research, services, and supports. And this plan includes 23 objectives that address research, services, and policy, and a budget recommendation. Right now, the current committee is developing a new seventh edition of the IACC strategic plan. You may be wondering, so what is the process that is used to shape federal priorities for autism? So I like to think of this process in three stages, the first of which is collaboration. That is bringing everyone to the table, including federal agencies, public members, and also incorporating input from speakers and public commenters that participate in the meetings of the IACC. So why is it so important that so many different people with many different kinds of expertise have a seat at the table? I think of this in three ways, that it helps us identify the issues, to vet and refine priorities from various perspectives, and also to create partnerships among federal and community partners to conduct the work. The second stage in this process is cohesion. That is, taking the vast diversity of the IACC and its perspectives into unity, coalescing around a cohesive strategy, covering the range of needs, and this involves listening respectfully to others and looking for the common ground. Also, it's required that we acknowledge differences and avoid gridlock. And by following this process, we can create a collective voice around priorities for autism. The third stage, which is the most challenging perhaps, is building a sense of community. That is, fostering mutual support and understanding and valuing people who have a different experience from our own. In this, we have to commit to ensure that all needs are met and provide, and we do this by providing support to people on the autism spectrum and their families, and also by working to create a society that is welcoming and inclusive. One where we eliminate discrimination and stigma around autism. Working together, we can build a positive future where all people on the autism spectrum are supported, valued, accepted, included, and empowered to achieve their full potential. So you may be wondering, how do I, as the Acting National Autism Coordinator, support these efforts? I work with the Federal Interagency Workgroup on Autism, which is a group of federal agencies that meets outside of the IACC meetings to facilitate coordination across these federal agencies on implementing IACC recommendations and priorities, and on facilitating the exchange of information across agencies. And I also work individually with federal agencies to connect them with government and non-government partners to advance autism efforts. In addition, my office coordinates federal agency input for federal reports, such as the 2021 HHS Report to Congress on the health and well being of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So, what is on the horizon for the IACC? As I mentioned, we're currently working on gathering input toward the development of a new IACC strategic plan. And I provided a few examples of new or emphasized themes that have been identified to date from public comments and other sources, including individuals with intensive support needs, equity and disparities, co-occurring conditions, acceptance and inclusion, the full lifespan into older age, access to care and services, and harnessing advances in science and technology. So if you'd like to learn more about the IACC, I'd like to invite you to visit the IACC website where we have lots of information about the activities of the IACC, as well as the activities of federal agencies that are working on autism. I'd also like to invite you to join us on April 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern for the NIMH OARC Special Event for Autism Awareness Month which is called Animating the Future for Exceptional Minds, where we will be hosting the amazing organization Exceptional Minds from Los Angeles that helps prepare young adults on the autism spectrum for careers 
in animation, digital arts, and entertainment. I'd like to acknowledge the OARC staff. This is the group of dedicated individuals that works with me every day to make all of this work possible. And I'd like to acknowledge also the members of the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee and people in the public who regularly contribute to the IACC and all of the work that we're doing. And lastly, here's how you can connect with us. You can visit the website. We'd love to have you join us for the next IACC meeting on April 13th and 14th where we're going to be talking about housing and communication. We also would welcome you to give public comment to the IACC in writing or via video conference. And here's our address where you can contact us and we'd welcome you to join our mailing list or Twitter. So thank you so much for hosting me today. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. Just raise your hand and we'll come around with the microphone. We have one question here. Sorry, I, uh, I you know, when else is gonna ask a question, I'll ask a question. Um, well, I've had this question, but um, so uh, there's a lot of confusion because the IACC doesn't actually recommend or they can't approve funding, right? So people say, oh, well, the IACC should fund this, the IACC should, should, should do that. So can you explain the process about how recommendations from the community and the strategic plan then translate into potential funding opportunities? Yes, I'm happy to do that. So. The ICC strategic plan is a really influential document that is looked at by all of the federal agencies that sit on the committee and other federal agencies that aren't on the committee to understand what needs to be done for autism. And as I said, I work with the federal interagency work group on autism specifically towards helping them with implementation of the recommendations in the strategic plan. And because the IACC is a group of both federal ag agency officials and public members that work together, federal agencies already have buy-in to the plan. They're a part of the process, which is one of the unique things about this particular committee that I think is highly effective. And so agencies are already committed to wanting to achieve the goals in the strategic plan, and they, but they have to decide within their agencies how they're going to allocate their budgets and achieve the various goals. Thank you for your presentation. Um, very informative about what the IACC does. I have a quick question. Um, how has the representation, and I'm over here, by the way. Oh, Sorry okay. about that. I couldn't see. <laughs> um, how has the representation of, of individuals with autism on the community changed over the years? I don't know if you could speak to that a little bit. Yes. Well, so when I first started, the IACC was 19 members, and there was one individual on the autism spectrum on the committee. At this point, we have seven members on the spectrum on the committee, and the, the law has changed. Initially, it said that we needed two from each of three categories, including individuals on the autism spectrum, family members, and leaders of organizations. And now the Congress requires us to have three of each category. And many of the members actually wear multiple hats. For example, they may be both a person on the autism spectrum and a parent, or a parent and an advocate that works at an organization. So many people do cover more than one category. Hello, Susan. Hi. Um, I had the pleasure of presenting at the committee a couple of years ago, and I love the sign that you put up of Switzerland. Um, I think that's really important because there are such diverse opinions um, on neurodiversity versus autism as a disability. And I'm just wondering, it's been several years since I was there, has that um, chasm uh, improved in terms of uh, its um, understanding of each perspective? Well, it's constantly evolving. And as you know, the autism community is very passionate about sharing their views. And there is a diversity of views 
but we feel like there's room at the table for different viewpoints at the IACC. And so even though sometimes it can get a little bit tense when people are sharing things that are really passionate about and people have different ideas, we welcome all of those views. And there is an, a continuing evolution on thoughts about how to incorporate all of these things together. Sorry about that, better, yeah. I think my friend Marjorie anticipated my question a little bit, but I was curious how you manage or if you have any advice for those of us, as you know, there's a broad range of opinions for those of us who work in, in the field as to the best ways to, uh, you know, both manage and incorporate and get everyone working together when you have such a broad diversity of opinions. Plus also just even advice in working with groups with scientists, government officials and lay people. Uh, but you might have some tips that would help all of us in the field, thanks. Well, I think it's really important to carefully listen to what people are saying. And there tends to be a lot of emotionality in the community and people sometimes when you're talking about your family member or you're talking about your own personal experience, it can be very emotional. And to try to stay calm and listen for the truth because people are usually sharing from their heart about what they really care about and what's important to them and how they've been affected. And so sometimes you have to cut past the exact language people are using or some of the emotion that's in what they're talking about to really listen for what they need and try to honestly think of ways that we can mutually support each other and try to meet multiple goals at the same time. And so sometimes that means two parallel paths to meet two different goals. And sometimes that means coming together and using a big umbrella to, to reach all of those goals. Hi, um, I've been so happy to see how the plan has evolved over the past 14 years. It was very much genetic and behavioral, and now it's much more whole body autism. For example, there's a lot more attention on severe autism, which is great. And you advocate in the plan for co-occurring condition research to be funded, which is again, wonderful. But there seems to be still little understanding of that at the level it gets funded. I wonder, is there any way we can reach those people, make them understand why this research needs to be funded? Well, co-occurring conditions actually got added to the strategic plan in 2010. And so it's uh, relatively speaking, fairly new. So the parts of funding that are large now were invested in a long time ago, and those were paths that were forged a long time ago. And so some of the new, newer areas for example, uh, research on adults, research on co-occurring conditions, it will take time to cultivate those streams of research to the point that they grow. Um, they are growing as we track in our annual uh, report on the portfolio analysis, but it does take time to cultivate those. So the ones that you see that are big now, those were seeds that were started quite a while ago. Hi, um, I have to second uh, sort of the, the excitement I see about some of the bullet points of the, the strategic plan going forward. Um, I'm really curious to know, given sort of this next uh, cohort of individuals aging up into adulthood that have really been diagnosed, um, seeing the prevalence estimates change so much since the early 2000s, what kinds of conversations are being had around um, residential supports and strategic plans for that, given um, the, the bullet points on um, individuals with intensive needs, as well as reaching sort of the full lifespan and um, there being a range of reasons why individuals need to access residential supports and knowing that there's really never enough to go around right now. Yes, absolutely. So with residential supports, we're actually going to be talking about that at our April 13th and 14th meeting. So you might be interested in tuning in. We just had the Department of Housing and Urban Development added to the committee by Congress this last round. And so they are getting very involved in looking at options for autism, and they've been very cooperative and, and excited to work on this. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion, and in the committee, a lot of interest in looking at adult life and how we can support adults on the autism spectrum. So I expect to see quite a bit of action in this area in the coming years. Thank you so much.